Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Great to have you with us. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here yet again for the uh, the seventh in a series of seminars organised by the CESAR Joint Undertaking to look at what it is that we need to do to build back better, what it is that we need to do to recover and the role that technology can play in that recovery as we go forward. And we couldn't have a better a better group of people to speak to on that subject today. It's absolutely my pleasure to introduce Grazia Vitadini, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Airbus. So obviously talking not a, a, about the airframe, but not only the airframe, how the airframe uh, interacts with the ground and so forth. We also have Mr. Patrick Key, who is the Executive Director of EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency. But Patrick, of course, is extremely well known to CESAR because he was the CESAR Joint Undertaking's original Executive Director. Uh, and we have the current Executive Director of CESAR as well, Mr. Florian Gillemay with us uh, uh, as ever to, uh, to have this conversation. It's a, it's a fascinating topic. Um, and how the technology works with COVID uh, becomes a really interesting, an interesting question. So perhaps, Grazia, I can start with you and, and ask you, how has COVID changed your vision for the future? What, how do you see the future from here? Well, you know, Andrew, only nine months ago, uh, the dilemma uh, we were debating around as an industry was was centered uh, around how to possibly align the exponential growth of air traffic with our responsibility to advance on, on, on climate neutrality for future generations to come. Now, this feels literally like ages ago. Um, well, in, instead of talking about exponential growth like we have been in the last, uh, in the last few years, some may now wonder um, how how can aviation possibly emerge from the pandemic with climate neutrality still as, as core long-term um, competitiveness factor? And while the answer is pretty straightforward to that, because it would be impossible not to. So already before the crisis, it had become accepted uh, that you know preserving our climate, uh, preserving the environment is the indispensable foundation upon which to build the future of aviation. And now while well, what we observe is that the corona uh, virus crisis has only dialed up the urgency for, for a healthy environment. And we believe a green recovery is absolutely non-negotiable. Non um, and this is also why as, as part of the, of the recovery plan with our European partners, we're really accelerating uh, on that front, so on research and cleaner aviation technology. And we believe in particular that hydrogen um, does hold in the sense uh, exceptional promise as, as clean aviation fuel. Um, so we were, we were discussing about it briefly. Uh, we recently unveiled um, our zero E, so three hydrogen uh, powered concept aircraft. Uh, as a cornerstone really behind our intent to bring the world's first zero emission commercial aircraft to market by by 20 2035 but my colleagues on the panel and certainly most of you tuning in today know there's no for the industry for our industry there is no silver bullet solution when it comes to decarbonizing the skies so we're going to have to work on multiple technology pathways we're gonna to need to continue pushing forward with the production, the uptake of sustainable aviation fuels, and uh, we're gonna to need to accelerate also on the digital transformation, uh, on application of digitalization of more autonomous flight um, with the uh, enabling element of artificial intelligence. This will all be, I believe, the new normal um, when it comes to connectivity and passenger experience in air travel of the future. Wow. So our vision, to summarize, has not changed. Right. Uh, but we do hope that the crisis will have a sort of silver lining and help us accelerate change. So uh, it, it's something that I'm I'm beginning to believe more and more that COVID hasn't changed anything. It's just accelerated everything. Um, I, my one hope is that by 2035, you thought of a better name than zero e. But you know, leave that aside for a moment. Um, 
the I'm, I'm really interested, obviously, I, I could talk to you all day about the hydrogen aeroplane, but I'm also really interested in your comment about IT and, and the IT changes that are going on. Specifically, I guess that talks about communicating between the airframe and the ground and the airframe and the controllers and whatever. Um, what's your vision for that? So, um... D digitalization, of course, um, has uh, many uh, different uh, implications in an industry like ours. It, uh, it relates, of course, to how you design, manufacture, operate uh, a, an aircraft, right? So um, a lot of uh, many projects and also investments really to develop a digital design, manufacturing and, uh, and services digital backbone uh, going across uh, across the whole company. But of course, there's a significant uh, dimension of it, uh, which I'd like to see significant acceleration on related to the environment where our products operate. And that is uh, the air <laughs> and specifically air traffic uh, and integration, let's say more globally of, of air uh, of air vehicles in, 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 in airspace. So we, we always, we continue considering shaping the future of, of air travel uh, in, a very, in a very holistic uh, way. And the ambitions, um, digitalization ambitions in this sense, absolutely remain unchanged, also in a COVID affected, uh, affected world. We, um, we continue operating uh, an outdated architecture when it comes to our own traffic management. I've done the parallel again uh, already before. You know, uh, when it comes to telecommunications, uh, old black and white photos of, of telecom operators sitting at these huge uh, switchboards, plugging connections manually. When I, when I think of how we are uh, for forcing our operators to work today, well, this is the image I, I think of. Right? It, it represents how we still operate air traffic today. Um, ATM, air traffic management, continue, will continue uh, playing a crucial role uh, when it comes to minimizing the impact of, 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 of uh, you know, traffic on, on flight efficiency and to keep deviations from, from most efficient trajectory as small as, as possible. And that famous 10% we continue matching with the, with the ATM potential is very true. Uh, so uh, how are we going to accelerate on digitalizing um, air traffic management? Our perspective, Airbus perspective, is that we could do so uh, via um, unmanned traffic management definition. Starting from that, digital unmanned traffic management solutions, we, um, we do aim to tackle uh, the ATM infrastructure as a whole and modernizing it, digitalizing it, make it making it fit to face the challenges, uh, so, certainly at European level. So Patrick, is that your vision that at the moment the controllers are like telephone exchange operators connecting hooks and that we've got to move to a, an era of UAM and things like that? So I, 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 uh, I share a lot of uh, what uh, Grazia was, was explaining. If you, if you look at uh, the VHF radio, which is uh, the safety link between air traffic controllers and, uh, and the pilots, do you know when the VHF was invented? Andrew? Well, Marconi invented it in the 1890s. It's a World War I <laughs> technology. It's a World War I technology. It's, uh, you know, I, I, yes, it's uh, 1940s uh, that uh, VHF was, was used. And to have, you know, a very modern uh, uh, sector like aviation still relying on its core safety functions on uh, 1940s technology, that's a disgrace. That's a disgrace. So, so what, what's the alternative? So, so and, and, and when you, when you, just to, I'll give you another example, which is, you know, people were saying, yes, aviation is global and therefore you need a, a global standard in order to be able to change it, which is true. Uh, and ICAO um, uh, found or, or defined a standard for uh, digitalization, which means exchange of emails. Do you know when this standard was developed? Now you got me there. When was that? 
1990, right. okay? The ATN, so-called ATN standards. Yeah. And 30 years later, 30 years later, it's still not implemented. So, so why not? Why not? So, so, so all kinds of reasons, you know? Um, um, uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, the, the fleet, the, the worldwide fleet was very diverse and they were, you know, the, the, the life cycle of an aircraft is very long. Uh, so you have aircraft which were flying in our skies, which were 25, 30 years old, typically. And, you know, to bring in new digital technology on board a very old aircraft is not uh, cost efficient. So there were all kinds of reasons. Then on, 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 the, on the side of the, uh, of, uh, of the ground uh, deployment, it was always, you know, there is too much uh, traffic. We don't have enough capacity, so we don't have the time to train the controllers. We don't have the time to uh, implement it in the, in the ground systems. There was never the time because of the traffic pressure. So there, I fully agree with uh, what you were saying, both of you, which is that, um, in my view, the COVID crisis should also accelerate things like this. You know, we have a golden opportunity now because first, a number of airlines are getting rid of their old aircraft, which uh, are polluting more, uh, let's say, and uh, and which are not as cost efficient as the latest aircraft. So, uh, less and less old aircraft are flying. First point. Second point. There is spare capacity available in the system, which means that uh, we can, it's not about taking risk, but we can spend some efforts, time in implementing new solutions on the ground. And I, I really think it's the case for, for digital, but it's the case for a number of uh, changes uh, in, in Cesar, for instance. It's now time to invest into those changes, into implementing those changes, because when the traffic is coming back again, we won't have the time anymore. There'll, so there'll now is the opportunity to do it. So, Grazia, it's your fault for building airplanes that go too well. Should you be building more, you know, obsolescence into what you do? I mean, I've always, I've always wondered what would the situation be if Apple made airplanes. You know, first of all, you'd have to change them every five years, and secondly, every two years, you'd have to work out a different way to put the fuel in. Um, is, is, Florian, is that the issue, do you think? Is it that, well, sorry, let me rephrase it. Do you think Patrick's right that this is a golden opportunity to jump forward? Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, well, I, I will not disagree to that, of course. I mean, to me, um, we have clearly an opportunity ahead of us, but this will be difficult. We know it as well because we have to keep uh, the, the financing capability within the system. And I think this will be probably the, the tough part to, to crack. But regarding the, the fact that we have here a window of opportunity, I'd just like to pick one example building on the, uh, what Gratia has uh, highlighted in terms of uh, environmental um, uh, benefits or, or how uh, the flying environment of the aircraft has a role to play in this equation. Um, today, we have no constraints in the airspace because we have very uh, little traffic compared to uh, what we had about one year ago. So we should build on this situation as a new norm um, to make sure that when progressively the traffic comes back, uh, we set the new procedures, the new tools in order to accommodate this traffic without deteriorating the performance of the trajectory so that the aircraft can actually fly the way it has been built and designed to fly which is not the case in a, a usual um, uh, day of traffic in Europe. Uh, just to, to keep in mind um, what happened in 2008 uh, from that standpoint when we started to have this uh, capacity crisis, um, the numbers from Eurocontrol are, are quite, uh, I think, self-explanatory from that standpoint. We had 3% of traffic increase, but 7% of CO2 emission increase which shows that the potential we have in managing properly the trajectory of the aircraft is significant. And this is what we have an opportunity to focus upon in the years to come. So, but just to come back, Florian, to what you were saying a moment ago, you know, let's seize this opportunity. Is that really realistic? I mean, isn't, the, isn't one of the issues that the process of getting the technology developed and getting the, the technology certified and getting the technology approved and, and then rolled out. Isn't that a 20-year plan? Isn't that the problem? I mean, if we could capitalise on this little tiny crisis that's going to last, I don't know, 24 months. 
I, I think if we if we have this um, way of thinking in mind, uh, we are doomed to fail. Um, we, we have to acknowledge today that the pace of technology is not a 20 years uh, cycle. The pace is much faster uh, uh, than that. And, and to me, the big thing that we do observe in, in Cesar since I've started to work on this program is the acceleration of research and development. It's the acceleration of innovation. But at the same time, we take more and more time to implement. So we have a kind of growing gap uh, between what technology can offer and how we are actually using it. And, and this gap is so huge that in the case of uh, uh, data link as patrick was mentioning uh, we are now 40 years after basically the standard and the technology has been invented which by the way was for a different purpose and what we are trying to do today which is to exchange data to exchange a lot of information so that on the ground we don't have to invent or to guess where the aircraft is actually going and the fact is that today we have solutions for that. Um, and today I do think that we cannot implement technology for the sake of implementing technology. But again, we have a golden opportunity there to say we have a, a challenge in terms of environment. We shouldn't give up on that. And our duty in aviation, our duty uh, in air traffic control, and I think that should be as well the duty of the member states, it's to avoid that we have stupid trajectories of aircraft flying in the air as we had just one year ago. I mean, we could show the, you know, the trajectory uh, that were achieved in Europe. This is totally insane. If, we, if you show that to, to uh, youngsters, to students uh, or whoever as a, a kind of uh, environmental mindset, they, they tell you those trajectories should have been forbidden. They shouldn't be allowed to fly like this. But we, we're sort of at that <clears throat> irresistible force and immovable object interface, aren't we? I mean, everybody agrees with what you say, but yet change seems impossible to, to generate. I mean, Grazie, is the solution for you guys to simply not load VHF radios onto aeroplanes anymore and just tell <laughs> them, that's it, you know, we're done with this old stuff, let's go forward? It's always well, it's impossible here. until yeah, someone yeah. does it, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, indeed, yeah. <you> know. <laughs> So um, again, the, the ambitions are, are extremely high. The targets were already set before the crisis. Um, talk about, let's talk about a, the ATM, the ambition, you know, to get rid of all, uh, of all uh, inefficiencies like the one uh, uh, just, just mentioned by Florian by 2040. Okay, um, that's not gonna, that, that's not a walk in the park. That's a digital European sky, objective um so the way to to get there is is also um quite uh quite a i'd call it a no-brainer such a no-brainer that we even um co-signed a paper with the with boeing on on the topic right on how to uh use utm uh, to really um, approach the architecture uh, of, uh, of, of air traffic as a whole, to use that as a stepping stone, as a lever to, uh, to, to deploy a fully, a fully new, new concept, regardless, okay, whether it's a matter of uh, exponential traffic growth or just complexity. The, the airspace is finite. It will become more and more complex going ahead. Uh, it will not be only commercial aircraft. It will be unmanned um, air system, um, urban air mobility, uh, pseudo satellites, uh, you name it, sub suborbital uh, aircraft. So more and more requirements uh, really uh, expressing a need for, for new, new rules, adapted flight rules, uh, new procedures. And uh, we do share a common vision of a future um, of a future airspace, uh, Boeing and, and us going from low to high altitude uh, in a single uh, airspace system, in a way which which will be need to be as sustainable as as possible. And modernizing this is the important as a first stepping stone to really meet the self-imposed environmental targets we've set for ourselves. So I'm, is... I'm, I'm, I mean, this is all terrific and, and, and obviously I love it, but how do we get there? That, that Airbus and Boeing have jointly agreed that we need a, a significantly more automated and, and digital um, 
control of the airspace, you know, from both the grass or from the grass to the to outer space is great. But unless you build aeroplanes that respond to that, and more importantly, I think taking what Patrick was saying forward, stop any other system from working. Are we ever going to get to that change? I mean, there's a clear resistance to change from the from the airline operators and from the ANSPs because this is what they do today. You're asking incumbents to change, aren't you? Isn't that hard? Um, well, there's always a component of uh, of resistance to uh, to any radical change like the one we are we are tackling. Uh, and uh, it is very clear that at the end, our customers. Uh, the airlines need to be to 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 be in a position to operate their fleet um, also in a profitable way. So um, it would be totally unrealistic for them to alone bear, uh, you know, the, the the cost of whatever new development, be it at platform level, uh, be it uh, at, at architectural space architectural level. Um, so. It, it needs to be a holistic discussion with all key stakeholders around uh, the table, including the airlines, absolutely. And this is the same discussion we're having around, around green technologies, you know, around sustainable aviation fuel. Um, but but they, my, point, my point remains, driving that change is going to be difficult while we continue to have the ability to make no change. Um, isn't that, isn't that right? I mean, while we allow people the option of doing nothing and continuing to pander to that, we're never going to make those changes. I see an increasing um, level of, uh, of pressure, political and societal, around the topics of, uh, of sustainability and environment, which make it really, it's not, there, it's not an option. I don't believe we have an option anymore. Mm. And uh, sorry, you know th this is also all all the the public funding type of, of of support out there currently, both at national and European level, uh, both to to the industry, to the industry as a whole, right? Uh, research institution, manufacturers, operators, it all comes with green strings attached. Well, it didn't for a very long time, unfortunately, as we started bailing out airlines, but leave that aside for a moment. Maybe in the future they will. Patrick, aviation safety really hates radical change, doesn't it? Aviation safety loves incremental stuff. It loves keeping as many systems open as possible. Are you guys, are you guys the problem here? Um, I, well... What is true is that uh, aviation safety has been built uh, learning from the past and learning from the mistakes of the past. And as such, it is necessarily incremental. This being said, um, we are changing uh, because we realize that um, the technology is changing so fast nowadays that you cannot anymore rely on uh, the lessons learned from you know small incremental steps and that's and, and, and just to come back to, to the previous discussion i i think i i, I completely agree with uh, grazia on the fact that uh, the revolution in air traffic management will come from utm from the uh, you know from the lower sides uh, of the market which is the, the control at the low altitude uh, of uh, unmanned uh, vehicles, uh, uh, drones, and, and things like this. Now, I, where, where I, I slightly disagree with her is on the fact that um, uh, we would have a unified, harmonized solution between UTM and ATM, because I do believe that those are completely different markets, completely different types of uh, environments, which can have different technological solutions. So our approach on UTM, and uh, as you may know, we, we have proposed um, a regulation which is currently being discussed in the parliament, in the sorry, in the in the uh, in the committee, is to let the technology decide, but we provide performance targets on you know uh, what, how safe can it should it be and uh, what it should be about. And that's, I think, the right approach for regulators such as us, which is to say, you know, 
safety should be a target and what we would ask from the technology providers is that they prove to us that they can reach a safety level which is at least the one that we have today and we are not imposing anything in terms of uh, technological choices and that's i think a major change compared to the way in which safety was done uh, five years ago or ten years ago we are going towards more what we call performance-based approaches because the technology is changing so fast that uh, we as the regulators may not have the latest you know, knowledge uh, on the technology and it's much better to ask the industry to commit on a safety level and to prove to us that they can meet the expectations. So that's the way we are approaching it. And when you look at the drone market, I think uh, you know the regulations are not the limiting factor uh, on the development of drones so far. Now, we've sort of got two issues going on here, haven't we? We've got all this future technology and drones and what have you, and Grace, I'll come back to you in a moment to ask whether you agree that, that um, the drone market or the low level stuff and the, and the higher stuff is separate given that you build both but or you're looking at building both. But we've also got the other problem I'm still trying to chase up, which is how do we get rid of the old stuff that's on the back? Um, because whilst that's there, there's no incentive for a lot of operators to change, particularly in these economically difficult times for airlines. Um, one of the comments I've noticed on the chat, incidentally, is that first you've got to fix the airlines and then you can worry about the green environment. I'd be interested in your views on that. But Patrick, I'm still very keen to, to push the point about how do we stop the old technology being used? I mean, is it is it a mandate? Is it, is it a drop dead date? What is it? So, you, you know, uh, within César, uh, we, we were looking at uh, concepts such as best equipped, best served. You know, depending on the level of technology that you have on board, you receive a different type of service. But don't now, we need to get to poorly equipped, no service? Possibly, possibly, but it's a policy. We, you, do you know, um, you know, uh, but uh, Florian is better placed than me to, to talk about it, but uh, do you know who is the first ANSP in the world who is going to um, uh, have, have in operations a full CESAR compliant uh, system? You know who? Now, this is one of these weird things where, you know, normally I ask the questions and you do the answer. <laughs> so, Florian <laughs> no, has, has the answer. What's the answer? Florian. Sorry, Florian. Florian, 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 Florian has the answer. I, I won't give it. Oh, Florian has Florian, the answer. Florian, try to hear. What's the answer? Is that you know the answer to that question? It's not in Europe. That's that's what I can say, unfortunately. It's, it's more towards the Middle East, um, if that's what Patrick wanted, <laughs> wanted me to say. <laughs> and, no, but that's, that's, that's very interesting because you have this very uh, significant uh, aeronautical country in the Middle East, which is investing into a full Caesar system for the ground. And, you know, they are going to uh, have an agreement with their local carrier, national carrier, on the fact that the national carrier is going to uh, equip the compatible technology on board the aircraft and then potentially they would propose a better service to the aircraft which are equipped and then guess why airlines who want to continue to take off and land at those airports will receive an incentive to invest into the new technology and soon after 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 some years huh, because it takes years you would have a capacity which is reserved for the high technology, you know, all the aircraft which are equipped, which is 80%, 85%, it's a policy uh, discussion, but 85% of the capacity of the airport would be reserved for high technology because you have a higher throughput, you have a higher capacity with higher technology, and just the remaining capacity will be available for uh, the aircraft which are not equipped. But certainly, a, a very good way uh, to implement new technologies and and, and give um, uh, give more incentives to the ones who are investing in getting a better service. That's what we do did as well with the noise. You know, at some stage we forbid access to some airports for very noisy aircraft. And uh, I believe that uh, at some stage the policymakers um, in Europe or around the world would have to do something similar for air traffic management. That's the way to go. And as far as, uh, you know, 
newer technologies are concerned for UTM and things like this, I think it's even simpler, you know. If you want to access an urban airspace, you have to have on board a certain technology, otherwise you just cannot uh, access the airspace. But so, that's easier. So again, we're back to a policy point, aren't we? I mean, I, I, I agree with you that we should make increasingly capacity only available for people that are best equipped or equipped for the right sort of things. The question only, I guess, is the is the angle of that slope, isn't it? Whether we allow 40 years or four years is, is sort of a policy decision. And, and we're in that place at the moment, and we are in this funny place right now, aren't we, where there isn't the traffic. So we could introduce a bunch of changes, um, but the airlines can't afford to upgrade the technologies or whatever. And so, Florian, lots of topics I need to talk to you about. I, I realise Caesar last week put out its most recent update on UTM and UTM technologies and where we're going, um, which I summarised as, you know, good progress, lots of work to do, I think it's fair to say. Um, what, what's your feeling on what Patrick was just saying, though, about driving the change? I mean, how do we, how do we fund all this going forward? Uh, well, there are, there are different things. Um, just, just to pick up maybe on the, on the UTM uh, example, I think for me what's really interesting in UTM uh, are, are two things. The first thing is um, what we thought in air traffic management was the most complex issue, which was to uh, have the kind of brain capacity to manage trajectories um, is something which is a no problem for the uh, uh, UTM people. Um, because all the vehicles, all the devices, they come um, uh, with communication capabilities uh, as native and with a lot of computing power on board um, and with the ability basically with, to exchange a lot of data and information with what could be a, a ground system. Um, what is on the other hand their problem is what we have addressed in aviation, which is uh, basically how you position the device properly, the uh, a level of performance you have for communication, the uh, level of performance you have for navigation, and so on. Um, and, and this is where I do see a lot of complementarity between the two worlds. I think we can really learn from the experience of UTM, and that's why right. we, we, we've tried to achieve uh, over the three years of, uh, of project activities that we've done in Cesar. Um, we can learn from them um, and we can as well help them to progress. And this is where I think the two worlds are coming together and uh, this is as well, uh, I think, the spirit of the initiative that uh, Gracia was mentioning uh, between Airbus and Boeing to say, okay, we can really uh, work together to build uh, uh, something uh, different in the future. What is interesting as well from, um, uh, I would say it's more uh, 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 how we work with those newcomers, uh, they have a very different attitude uh, to the ones we have in the nation. Um, they are not like, uh, oh, we've got a solution, please put a piece of regulation on this uh, VHF radio or on this uh, uh, ATN baseline or whatever. Uh, uh, they are more in the, in the look for a challenge. Uh, so they are really saying, okay, what do you want us to do? What is the level of performance um, you want us to achieve? Uh, and this dialogue is very useful because they are not trying to uh, sell you something, they are trying to cope with the requirements you are setting to them. Sometimes they fail, by the way, uh, sometimes they are making promises that they cannot uh, meet, but um, uh, it's really good to see um, that uh, uh, it's a different attitude than to say, okay, I have to comply with uh, this piece of software, I have to comply with this piece of standard. No, it's a compliance with a, a performance requirements that they are looking for, which is pretty much what uh, Patrick was describing. Now to come back to uh, uh, what makes sense in terms of uh, uh, accelerating the pace of implementation, I think we have to, to stop um, uh, to incentivize the slow movers, uh, which is pretty much all what the current system is doing. Uh, we have airlines which are the, the most equipped uh, uh, airlines with the uh, highest technology aircraft, whether it comes from Boeing or from Airbus, uh, which are paying for a ground system that they are not able to use. And not only that, but they are paying for the systems that they cannot use, um, uh, like uh, the data, data link communication. So as long as we um, allow for this type of uh, you know, behavior in the system, we are not going to make progress, like it was the case on data link. Look at what happened again. I think we could draw lessons for hours on that. Uh, we had uh, a number of ANSPs which were late on the mandate. What happened to them? Basically nothing. Uh, they were subsidized by EU funds to catch up, while the other ones who were on time didn't get any kind of reward for that. Yeah, so we, this is one key. 
There's another there's another issue I could raise as to why that was perhaps to do with the fact they were French, but let's leave that aside. What we're doing at the moment is we're not only not incentivizing incentivizing the fast movers, we're actually we're punishing the fast movers, aren't we? And and that's the issue I think. Where how do we how do we turn that around and start to drive everything forward? And so perhaps to bring it back to um, Grazia's very first point, which is. To what extent is the sustainability in the green agenda able for us for, for us to, to piggyback on to try to drive some of these changes, do you think? Question for the panel, anyone who wants to take that point. Well, maybe, maybe I can start. Um, I, I, I think uh, we have a golden opportunity uh, to, because uh, aviation is going to be in a recovery mode. And there are different qualities to the recovery uh, that we can that we can uh, incentivize, and definitely the recovery should be a green recovery. And what I would like to add is possibly that uh, the recovery should be a technologically um, how should I say technologically positive recovery, which means that uh, you know uh, a lot of the problems that we had. Uh, for the implementation of uh, of uh, new technologies was uh, the equipage the, the equipage of the fleets okay but now that um, uh, let's face it for the for the next two years mostly modern aircraft because they are most more, more cost effective are going to fly it's a golden opportunity i believe to be at the same time uh, efficient in terms of uh, environment, but also efficient in terms of uh, technology. Because as soon as we get a certain um, consistency or homogeneity, I don't know if the, the, the word, word exists in English, uh, in the fleet, then we can start to really make progress on the implementation of new technologies uh, on the ground as well. So I, I really do think that uh, uh, there is an opportunity uh, nowadays, in the next uh, one, two years, because capacity is likely not to be a major issue for air traffic management, uh, there is really uh, an opportunity to be greener, to learn how to uh, give greener trajectories, to come back to, uh, to what uh, Florian was saying, but also to uh, incentivize uh, the uh, implementation of new technologies uh, also as part possibly of the recovery package. Right. Grazie, do you agree with that? Yes. At Airbus, we're, we're, we're absolutely convinced that a green recovery is, is non-negotiable. So we remain absolutely steadfast in our commitments to, to decarbonize the whole sector. Now, as we already stated, the crisis can be really the accelerator to force all actors to, to work more more closely together and uh, and really build back better. And let's not forget, especially in these times, of course, we're going to have to consider the competitiveness of the sector and specifically um, of the European transport sector. Um, and how do we make sure, how do we ensure this competitive, how do we safeguard it? Uh, we need to develop a European technological independence and innovation uh, capacity, really investing very clearly in research and innovation in, in structural projects to allow us to, to, to go into technologies which will make it through, uh, through the market. So, so that's a really good way to segue back to the discussion about UAM and those sorts of things. Um, Patrick takes a view that perhaps the two are separable or severable. Um, but Boeing, uh, sorry, Airbus, that was Freudian, Airbus um, has already committed itself to being really all in on the UAM sort of market. You see, I presume you see UAM as sort of part of a continuous spectrum at, with all the other aircraft. Is that right? Well, definitely a coexisting um, component. So, um, in this sense, the two systems, if not integrated, UTM and ATM, must be seamlessly connected um, 
interoperable uh, across uh, across country. The the UTM we're looking to uh, system we're looking to 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 develop um, needs, of course, to be compatible with any uh, ATM upgrade and needs to be interoperable between different service providers, different vehicles, operation types, countries, existing ATM systems. So um, definitely you cannot develop the two separately from, from one another. So where do you see the where do you see the responsibility lie between the vehicle, the airframe of whatever shape? Uh, and and the ground, and then secondly, to what extent do you think the ANSPs have a role in that? Well, the underpinning main principle is safety, first of all, right? Safety first, always. Meaning uh, the safety both at platform and also at uh, in terms of uh, reduction of risk, uh, risk and workload of, of, uh, of ATC, in, in increasingly complex spaces must be our driving uh, factor and main main underpinning uh, principle. So based on that, the roles and responsibilities need to be defined. Right. Patrick, what about you? Where do you see the line between the airframe, if you like, and the ground? So for, for UTM, um, we, are, we are talking about completely new types of vehicles, which are for the most uh, for most of them completely automated, which means that, uh, you know, you would need to rely much more on uh, the capability of the aircraft to uh, avoid collisions, basically, mm -hmm. first point. But you, all, you would also need to rely a lot on what we call the tactical separation between, between the aircraft, because the trajectories are going to be defined from the ground and before the flight is, uh, is happening or even you know, uh, re, uh, reshaping the, the trajectory according to events and things like this, but it, it's not in the order of seconds, right? it's in, in the order of uh, minutes, uh, to, 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 to put it very simply. So I, I, I do believe that uh, uh, the distribution of roles between the ground and the airframe is going to be significantly different because we are talking about, um, you know, uh, mostly drones uh, flying uh, in an urban environment um, with uh, a time of reaction which is completely different from an aircraft flying uh, in the upper airspace. I, I completely agree with, um, uh, with Grazia on the fact that uh, we need to make sure that the UTM and ATM systems are interconnected, interoperable, because the difficulty is going to be, as always, at the interface. And how do you deal with, uh, typically, you know, uh, other vehicles which are flying in cities such as helicopters, uh, police helicopters, emergency helicopters and things like this. So we, we really need to make sure that the two systems can operate one with another. Uh, but in my view, it's, the, 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 it's different philosophies, different concepts. Now, for the, for, the, for the responsibilities of the different actors, the NSPs, have definitely uh, a responsibility in terms of uh, sharing the information on airspace, sharing the information on traditional um, uh, transport vehicles, traditional traffic and so on and so forth, and the other way around, which is the NSPs have to know what is going on in the UTM airspace in order to make sure that they can protect the conventional uh, traffic from, from, uh, from drones and, and, and unmanned uh, aircraft. Now, does it mean that the ANSPs should be in charge of UTM? Yes, possibly, but not, not mandatory. Huh? So uh, I believe that in some cases, uh, of course, ANSPs would be the best place to become UTM service providers. But in other cases, there could be also other types of organizations which are better placed. Uh, it's, uh, it has to be uh, on, a, on, a, you know, uh, on a ad hoc uh, basis and as far as our regulations are concerned, we we have kept things quite open. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I it's hard not to see that as the future, isn't it? Um, so where we go from here? But that actually brings me to my last question, which is, where do you think our focus should be in the short, the medium, and the longer term? Where should we be focusing our attention on the technology, focusing our expenditure, and things like that? Um, so maybe we go Patrick uh, Grazia and then Florian. 
Uh, good to see you back, Florian, uh, at the end, if you could. So ver very briefly, because we are quite short on time, but thanks, Patrick, if you would. So very briefly, green recovery, uh, it has to start now. And, uh, you know, I, I know that uh, Airbus doesn't like it, but uh, you can talk about cash for clunkers. Is that the right term? Yes. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to have more modern aircraft uh, equipped with the best technology uh, available at that time uh, for, for ATM. So it, it has to start now and it should start now for sure. Uh, and then um, I, I think that uh, we need to talk uh, to the NSPs about the green recovery from their side as well. What does it mean? What does it entail? Are there changes, investments which are needed in order to make it more green? And uh, as part of the green recovery for NSPs, I do believe that there, there should be a technological component which would provide incentives to, uh, to, uh, in, to uh, modernize the systems. Cash for clunkers, good news for you, Grazia, isn't it? People buying new aeroplanes. We serve uh, the market, uh, <laughs> just like our competitors do. Well, you do. Uh, so what, what's your idea for where should we be putting our focus? Um, I can only uh, really um, support uh, all what, uh, what Patrick has just uh, stated. If not now, when? If not now, when? Let's not forget um, other important aspects of what we've just discussed linked to standardization. So progressing on that green transition and path, a very difficult um, path of change, um, of change means uh, also um, having to have the edge on implementing new standards worldwide. We're going to need a very sound um, European framework um, as a key enabler to, to achieve this. Europe can and must lead the transition to zero carbon worldwide um, aviation. And we're gonna need to make sure we have all actors on board to ensure, uh, to ensure success. Right. And we're looking, of course, uh, to CESAR um, with, uh, with a lot of interest, with funds, with resources um, to really uh, make sure the single European sky uh, does uh, start uh, tangibly taking shape. So, Florian, I thought that was good news for you that everyone's looking to seize RJU with the resources to, to put in place an implementation plan because I can't help but think a lot of what we've talked about today is actually political, not technological at all. And, and how do we drive the political change? And I suspect it's by having a plan that is credible and that everyone signed on to. Where do you think we should be putting our focus, short, medium and, and longer term? Well, I think the, the green recovery path that has been uh, depicted by Patrick and, uh, and supported by Gracia is, is where we can act as well in the context of Cesar. Um, I would just like to add to that that uh, we can act by incentivizing the early movers, the ones who really want to take that path that are uh, uh, geared towards it, uh, geared towards the usage of technology for greener trajectory, but as well uh, by connecting the value chain of modern aircraft, uh, proper behaviors of airlines, airports, uh, in terms of environmental uh, uh, behavior, uh, is what we can do, for instance, through the notion of uh, uh, grid aviation demonstrators that we are uh, preparing in the context of the future program. Uh, so that basically the ones who are ready to move have, a, a, through Cesar, a platform to take the first steps and as well some uh, financial advantage to take those first steps. Right, so we need we need political will, we need a, a sensible plan, we need to stop researching and start deploying perhaps, and, and the opportunity perhaps exists now like it never has before. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've run out of time, but I'd really like to uh, thank um, Grazia and Patrick, as well as Florian, of course, for what I think was a really interesting conversation, which could have gone for another two hours, to be honest. I have to keep chopping things down and I apologise for that. This is the last in our current series of uh, webinars, but I do hope that you'll agree that we should get, carry on this conversation for as long as is necessary. So I'd, uh, I, I wish you all a very good day and I hope that you stay safe and sound and I hope to see you soon in person very soon indeed. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Sure. Merci, merci. Merci.